日本史学習に最高にもってこいのサイトサムライアーカイブスポッドキャストへようこそ美しい自然にあふれてる縄文時代から波乱万丈な幕末まで全時代を網羅して日本史の隅から隅まで一緒に語り合いましょうでは早速日本史の世界へ Hey, welcome back to the Summer Archives podcast. We're back. Today we'll be talking about tea for the third time in, I guess, about five episodes. So thanks for joining this exciting tea roller coaster.、Uh, at some point, I plan on doing a biography of Sen no Rikyu, who was a famous 16th century tea master. But in the meantime, I'll probably be doing some other things. I, I don't like to stay on one subject for too long because I get bored. Which I guess probably isn't the best thing for the coherence of the podcast. But, you know, like I said, I like to mix things up. And before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to all the Patreon patrons who have been helping out to make this possible. And just in case you're a listener out there listening in listener land, willing to help out, check out patreon.com slash samurai archives. Even if you don't think you're able to contribute, you can still check it out to get the public podcast updates. And then also, definitely check out samuraipodcast.com for more information about each episode and the other ways that you can help throw us your support. Okay, so last time I talked about tea, I talked about the ancient history and development of tea culture up through the end of the 15th century. So if you haven't heard the first part、uh, about the early history of tea, then you'll definitely want to listen to that episode first. That was episode number 143, or technically Tales of the Samurai number three. But regardless, you can find it at samuraipodcast.com or iTunes or YouTube or wherever you get these episodes. So, like I talked about last time, I was talking about tea. Tea came, went, came back again. And by the late 15th century, the tea ceremony began to develop, mostly due to the patronage of the 8th Ashikaga shogun, Yoshimasa. And I never know how much backstory I need to prep these sorts of episodes, but I think I should talk about exactly what the tea ceremony is. It's easy to forget that the average person probably has no idea what a tea ceremony is. Although I'm going to assume that if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have some notion of what I'm talking about. But anyway, the whole concept of the tea ceremony is basically the elaborate ritual that consists of someone making and serving tea to one or more guests. Even when and how you drink the tea is part of the ceremony. But that's really about it. That's the general idea, anyway. Basically, just a sit down, let's drink tea together thing where one person serves and the other people drink. Pretty straightforward concept. So, like I mentioned in the tea episode with Dr. Workman, which I think was episode 142, the modern tea ceremony as an art could be compared to a martial arts kata. So, basically, it's an organized set of movements that are an artistic expression of the practitioner. You walk up to the tea set in a specific way, pick up this thing with this hand, stir with this hand, fold the napkin with that hand, that sort of thing. And, like I mentioned in that episode, I learned the tea ceremony about once a week for six months years ago in Japan from a stern old Japanese lady. And I've been served tea at tea houses and that sort of thing, but that's basically the sum total extent of my knowledge on tea. I'm definitely not an expert, so I did a whole lot of research for these tea episodes, so you don't have to. And so, hopefully, you'll get a good grasp of the tea ceremony by the time I'm done. So, let's get to the history. Now, if you remember from the last time I talked about tea, Tea culture was basically all about entertainment and partying, at least through the 14th century, and among aristocrats, probably later than that. Two men in the service of Ashikaga Yoshimasa, the artist Noami and the monk Murata Shuko, who I talked about a little in the last tea episode, helped to change tea culture from an entertainment to a more ritualistic ceremony in the mid to late 15th century. Noami was an artist and expert in Chinese art who was taken on to serve the sixth Ashikaga shogun Yoshinori and eventually became the curator of Ashikaga Yoshimasa's art collection, the next shogun. Noami developed the smaller tea room, basically repurposing the Zen reading room into a tea room, and incorporated the tea stand and simple monastery utensils into the tea ceremony. It was thanks to Noami that the tea ceremony became a permanent part of the shogun's court. So he was basically the guy that permanently put the tea ceremony on the map in Japan. Which allowed it to develop and grow. He sort of combined the idea of tea entertainment and the austere monastery tea rituals into a new thing. Now, as for Murata Shuko, I mentioned this last podcast, but I didn't really get too much into it. But Murata seems to have liked the secular life a little too much and seems to not really have taken his priestly duties too seriously. He was reprimanded endlessly by his superiors and eventually quit the monastery and became a wandering vagabond. After which, he hooked up with another famous monk slash vagabond, Ikyu Sojun. And one interesting anecdote that I came across was that at one point, Murata was tired of being reprimanded by the other monks, so he went to a physician because he couldn't pay attention. 
He was constantly missing details and just couldn't stay awake to avoid boredom. He told the physician that theology bored him to tears and meditation put him to sleep and begged the doctor to find him a medicine that would keep him awake and help him focus. He basically had medieval ADHD. So the physician prescribed him tea to help him concentrate. And then Murata then fell in love with tea and began reading all of the famous books on tea that he could get his hands on. It was through his tea obsession and tea study that he ended up in the employ of Ashikaga Yoshimasa. He apparently came into his employ through an introduction either by Noami himself or Noami's grandson, Soami. Soami was Noami's protege and carried on his grandfather's work in tea after he died. And as usual, the sources differ on whether it was Noami or Soami, or maybe even a random aristocrat who introduced Murata Shuko to Yoshimasa. One 16th century document called the Yamanoe Sojiki tells it like this. Yoshimasa, living in seclusion in Higashiyama, devoted himself to amusement in all seasons and both morning and night. One evening, feeling plaintive while waiting for the moon and listening to the cries of the insects, he summoned Noami and had him read from the tale of Genji, a passage about a discussion on a rainy night. And yeah, I gotta actually pause right here, because as an aside, if Yoshimasa is asking for a passage of the tale of Genji, he must have been really bored, because I've tried to read that like three times, and I actually just gave up. So that's just my little side note. But anyway, back to the text. They talked about all their old pastimes, from poetry and moon or flower viewing, to balls, bows, fans, and the writing of poems using plant and insect names. Yoshimasa lamented that they had exhausted every single amusing topic from the past. It has already become cold, he said, and I am too old to take my hawks and go hunting in the snowy mountains. Surely there is some unusual diversion for us to enjoy. Noami listened and replied respectfully, but with conviction, that the kettle envies the wind in the pines. There is an entertainment, he said, that is interesting in any season. It was at this point that Noami brought up the way of tea, and Murata Shuko's name came up, and the rest is history. Well, at least assuming that this is the correct version of history. Because, like I said, we don't really know for sure how Murata Shuko actually hooked up with Yoshimasa. But apparently, when Yoshimasa met Shuko, he asked him, he asked him about tea, and Shuko's response was, Tea is not play. It is not technique. It is not entertainment. Which I guess is a very zen answer. But I also think you can guess Yoshimasa's response, which was pretty much, uh, okay, so why do it? Which I'm paraphrasing. But Shuko's response was, Through tea, one exercises the Confucian virtue of decorum. Basically, the way Murata Shuko did tea was as a reflection of Confucian ideals. Basically, he'd serve tea to the person he was serving as if they were his lord, and everything he'd do would reflect that. Anyway, Murata Shuko would go on to continue the development of tea culture as a member of Yoshimasa's club, and is credited with making hanging calligraphy scrolls a part of the tea room decoration when he hung a scroll given to him by his old traveling buddy, Ikkyu Sojun. In fact, Shuko's tea ceremony was probably the direct ancestor of the modern tea ceremony. Murata's focus was on combining Chinese and Japanese tea culture and developing the four principles of the way of tea. So these four principles are wa, harmony, ke, reverence, Sei, purity, and Jaku, tranquility. His numerous followers continued to spread and develop his way of tea. He liked to keep things simple and liked to use what other tea people considered crude and artless tea bowls. These were basically handmade Japanese bowls by local artisans rather than the opulent Chinese imports. But it seems his focus on ordinary came from both his Zen influence and his association with Ikkyu Sojun. Apparently Sojun had felt that monks had become obsessed with ritual and power and had removed themselves from this secular world. Sojun's response to that was to find enlightenment in the everyday world. And his renouncement of the religious world in favor of mundane reality must have rubbed off on Murata Shuko. And don't get it twisted, Shuko didn't give up all the worldly things. He dealt in Chinese utensils and hobnobbed with the elites just like the other tea guys. I mean, you know, like I said, he was basically a former traveling partner of Ikkyu Sojun, who was basically a wild man. The only difference between Shuko and the rest was that his focus stayed on Zen, and I think that's why he was appreciated by Yoshimasa. That and the Confucian aspect of being treated like a lord by Murata Shuko, I'd imagine. And like I said, Shuko did use expensive antique tea utensils every now and then, going so far as to say that using these sorts of utensils in his simple straw hut multiplies the wow factor surrounding such fancy tea utensils. So he definitely wasn't immune to the more cultured and high-class aspects of the tea ceremony. In fact, he apparently had a saying that went, it is best to have a magnificent steed in a simple straw hut. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure what to make of this. 
Did he prefer the simple things or did he have a use for the expensive utensils or was it a case by case thing? It's really not that clear in what I found and it is a bit contradictory. But of course I made the effort to figure it out and the best I can tell, Murata Shuko's conception of tea was a mix of imperfection and perfection. I came across a quote that applies. Are we to view the cherry blossoms only in full bloom, the moon only when it is cloudless, to long for the moon while looking on the rain, to lower the blinds and be unaware of the passing of the spring, these are even more deeply moving. So think on that. My interpretation is that you can't appreciate perfection without some imperfection to highlight it. And this, boys and girls, is apparently the definition of wabi-sabi, otherwise known as the beauty of imperfection. And I used to hear wabi-sabi thrown around at Asian studies conferences constantly, and it kind of always seemed like a goofy and trite phrase just to throw around to sound philosophical or to sound like you're you know, in it at these conferences. And it kind of still does, but I guess that's the heart of the tea ceremony. And yeah, I don't want to just drop the phrase wabi-sabi and move on without explaining it, since I'm sure a lot of you listeners probably haven't heard of it. So in a nutshell, it's kind of like I said, it's pretty much explained as the beauty of imperfection. It's considered a Japanese aesthetic ideal. And, you know, I don't think we really have a Western conception of this idea, but it's kind of like the idea that scars add character to a person or some sort of age and wear on an object adds character, you know, something along those lines. But when it kind of came to me doing research for this, I decided to quit while I was ahead and defer to a philosopher for an explanation. So I asked Dr. Jesse Workman, what does beauty and imperfection mean? And I asked him if there's a Western equivalent. And he he actually came back with a 45-minute treatise on beauty. So this is where I go all inception on you and present a podcast within a podcast. But I had to edit it down to what is specifically germane to this episode because I wasn't really planning on inserting a 45-minute treatise into the center of this podcast episode. But just so you know, for the patrons on Patreon, his full discussion of beauty will show up on Patreon as bonus audio. So if you are interested in hearing the, the full discussion of what is beauty, what does it mean, how does the beauty of imperfection correspond to what we understand as beauty in the West, that kind of thing, then it will be available. But for now, I'll defer to Dr. Workman. Take it away. Wabi-sabi, which is the Japanese idea of imperfection, adding to, enhancing beauty. We experience this. We don't have a concept in the West for this. I'm willing to stand in defense of uh, my words, although I'd be delighted to be refuted. Um, if somebody knows beauty better than I do, which I admit, it's not my primary interest or it is not a reflection of of what I studied. I don't know as much about beauty as I'm in philosophy as I know about phenomenology. But here in the West, most of the time, because of Christianity, of Platonism, of, of, of Judaism, even in the Bible, we are repeatedly exposed to it again and again. The idea of perfection is the highest and most noble thing and honorable. Perfection, permanence, unchanging in terms of, uh, of objects, in terms of situations. There are always ideals, always ideals that we're trying to strive for. And each and every one of those ideas can be traced in many ways. The path can be traced all the way back to Plato's theory of forms. Aristotle had a different interpretation. It's that it, I'm not well versed in it, and I'm not entirely certain it would be useful to try to go into it as much. Probably wouldn't help me define the question I'm trying to answer. And that question is simply, what does it mean philosophically that imperfection, asymmetry, ugliness enhances beauty. It adds character. If you have, let's say you have a walking stick, and nobody would call a walking stick a beautiful thing. No. Uh, It has a purpose, but it could be beautiful. If it's a well-carved walking stick, let's say, if it's got designs carved into the handle, if the wood is very smooth, if it's well honed, the craftsman's care for making it is evident in its design, in its shape, in how it curves, maybe. Yet, if we encounter 
another walking stick. Let's say that Craftsman A designs staffs and different staffs, sticks that help you walk or even that are just ornamental. Craftsman A, he puts them out. They're beautiful. People buy them. They're wonderful. They're brand new. Now, Craftsman A has been doing this for 35 years. So if you find something he made, or she for that matter, 35 years ago, they weren't as skillful, let's say, and they don't have the same kind of finesse and polish and refinement as Craftsman A's work today. And what is more, the staffs carved by Craftsman A 35 years ago are pretty old, pretty beat up. They've been cracked, maybe. They've been scratched up. They've been bent, perhaps, if it has any give to it without breaking. Maybe the colors have faded or the shellac has chipped off or maybe some of the designs in the handle are almost flattened because that you've been holding it for 30 years or people have been using this for 35 years. The emotional response we'll have for it is that it's aged well and its beauty is enhanced, its character is deepened because this thing has been around for 35 years and people have been using it. They've been passing it from hand to hand. We're more inclined, I think, and I expect this is a universal trait. We would say that staff has more beauty because of its character. It has more character. It, 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 it enhances the beauty that still exists in the design by Craftsman A, in spite of uh, the fact that 35 years ago the Craftsman wasn't as skilled as, as they are now. Yet that old staff, because of its well-worn state, because it's ugly, it's somewhat uglified in a sense, isn't it? It's, uh, it's lost a lot of those qualities in their sharpness that made it beautiful when it was brand new. Or, well, let's talk about a painting. Uh, painter, painter B has been painting, let's say, for 10 years. Painter B is a proponent of modern art, that abominable postmodernism, which I loathe in all of its forms. Postmodernity, postmodern art, doesn't care about beauty. It doesn't attempt to be beautiful. There may be an underlying political reason or there may be an underlying statement. This is a reflection of our postmodern existence. Nobody's going to look at an Andy Warhol painting with soup cans and necessarily call it beautiful. They may try to argue the point, but I, I, I think nobody's sane. I think a minority of people would, would, because of the statement he might have been making with his pop art, well, it's beautiful. It's pro and certainly his work is valuable. Um, abstract expressionism. Okay, I don't think most people are going to call that beautiful. Okay, they might in terms of its chaos or its color mixing. Who knows? They might suggest that Jackson Pollock, his works have beauty in them, but I would argue that that's more because of the life of the man, of the artist, what he lived, how he, what he went through, the, the force of his personality imbues the, the work, more so than the qualities of the work that make a painting beautiful. So why is this? Because I've just said that sometimes asymmetry enhances the beauty of something. Yes, a lot of the architecture uh, of the modern day is not awe-inspiring at all. Boring, drab, ugly. How can a building be ugly? I don't know quite how to clearly explain this, but from a philosophical perspective, if we have an ugly building, what makes a building a prison? Blocky. What makes it ugly? Yet the old courthouse where they plan to lock up said Criminal C. Criminal C, you're going to prison. Nobody would look at Sing Sing and call it a beautiful building, yeah? But you would look at the Eiffel Tower or the Leaning Tower of uh, Pisa, you know, as it's poised to fall into the canal, okay? That's beautiful. The great cathedrals, they're beautiful. 
Some might call the White House beautiful because it represents American ideals, a city on a hill. But nobody would call, no one, nobody would call Folsom Prison. No one would call that beautiful. Nobody. I, I'm willing to go on record and make a statement 100%. No human being listening to my voice now would ever call a maximum security prison beautiful. They might not necessarily call hospital beautiful either. Universities, there's lots of beauty in some of our most prestigious universities. The way the buildings are, are constructed. The architecture is, is art. It is art. Even if the building is meant for a utilitarian, everyday, banal use. Architecture is art. These buildings are the works of beautiful uh, artists designing them. Again, it's human beauty, as I've said earlier on. It connects us to other human beings. It helps us feel more exalted in admiring the, the beautiful object, whatever it might be that people have made. It's symmetrical or it's graceful. You might, I've heard buildings described as their architecture is graceful, is flowing, is awe-inspiring. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, some of these designs of his are extraordinary. Bridges, bridges, beautiful structure. It's not necessarily beauty in its function, its functionality. It's so we can get across the river and, uh, and go home or go to work. But it's beautiful. The San Francisco, the Bay Bridge, beautiful. Beautiful because of its height, because of its length, because it, 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 might, look, it might look almost magical if it's narrow, if it's a, you know, the way the light hits it. Beautiful, but it's a bridge. But no one would call a sewage treatment plant beautiful. Although one might, I have certainly great respect for sewage treatment plants. It's a remarkable invention, actually, if, if you read up on them. It's extraordinary that human beings could design a system that, that is so efficient and effective in what it does. Why? Why? Now, what if one of these beautiful buildings, what if part of it was stove in uh, by a big storm, say? Well, we might rebuild it. We might try to restore it to the way it looked before. Or sometimes, depending on the nature of the damage, might be left left alone. Uh, in many cases, it would not add to its beauty. So we, we can certainly understand the wrong sort of uh, asymmetry and ugliness. It can cancel out the beauty of the whole, which is unfortunate. But we know that an old gnarled oak tree or a Christmas tree that's not symmetrical, we might experience that as more beautiful than something that is perfect, that is perfected. But in our case, it's not because of Buddhist concepts. It's because in order to understand beauty, we have to know ugliness. Without something to compare it and contrast it to, we cannot make that determination and we will not experience that. If we live in a world where everything is, everything is purely ugly, Right? or very, very boxy, very utilitarian, where our poetry is, is drivel, where our, our works of art, painting, sculpture, more drivel, postmodernism. No one is going to know what beauty is. You won't have the tools. You won't have the ability to experience beauty. That will be gone, or dwarfed, stunted, undeveloped. I didn't grow up listening to classical music. I have some acquaintanceship with it. I know it's very beautiful. It doesn't do anything for me most of the time. I didn't grow up with it. I don't have a sense of its beauty. There wasn't the contrast in, in my modern day upbringing. The contrast didn't exist. Opera. I do not like it. It's a, a reflection of my taste, perhaps. But I grew up listening to popular music, country, folk music, although I find I listen to a lot of music that's less well-known because it's more authentic, which isn't the same as beauty, but the two intertwine. If you lack the contrast, you cannot experience beauty. It's 
far more difficult because that, that perceptive ability might be blunted if you grow up in an ugly world. Now, it might be if you grow up in an ugly world and they take you out to the mountains, to a lake, to a river, you might be able to understand that you're in beauty. It might reach you to your very soul or it might bounce off you because why? So what? You don't have the breadth of experience to code for that. So it will just bounce off you. It will take you to uh, one of the great cathedrals uh, in England or France or what have you. Well, it's just a big building, you know? So what? It's, uh, it's really just a big, giant building. Uh, it looks a little different. It's remarkable, kind of, in its difference. But it doesn't look like the other buildings around it. But that beautiful church with the high steeple, I mean, the gargoyles... So what? And gargoyles are actually a great example because they're meant purposefully to be ugly. And yet, what are the most beautiful buildings in our world that we in the West agree are the most beautiful buildings in our world? If there are people left who still understand beauty and its implications that haven't been poisoned by our admittedly very unattractive modern world that we live in, those gargoyles enhance the beauty of the cathedral. Because then, even more, they don't uglify it the way damage would. They beautify it because the craftsmanship that went into designing and building them against and contrasted against the rest of the building, the flying buttresses, the way the light reflects off the stained glass, those gargoyles are the final finishing touch that adds an enhanced character and quality to that building it would be less beautiful if they were not there. Even though you'd still have the, the majestic quality, the spire, the stained glass, the flying buttresses, perhaps, the, 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 the engravings on the stonework, all that would be there. But if those gargoyles, if they were struck down by lightning or a storm or a, a bomb or something, they're gone, that building wouldn't have anywhere near as much beauty looking upon it from the outside, as it does with them there. We instinctively feel this concept that sometimes, given the right circumstances, ugliness, a blemish, an imperfection, adds character. It adds depth because it helps contrast for us more effectively. It's not the same in the East, and Chris will talk about this more. They're coming out of a different paradigm, a different worldview, different... Uh, train of, of, of thought and, and subsequently different experiences of, of beauty, different taste. Now, beauty has been discussed by these philosophers. They've argued about them in the West since the pre-Socratics. In our modern day, I think that the concept of beauty is diminished. It's more base. It's We live now in a, in a culture that this culture is exceptionally ugly. Uh, no, very little high art anymore. You know, poetry. Oh, come on, it's a laugh. It's a joke. You know, there might have been a time, fifty, sixty, seventy years ago, when you would hear different poetry, different rhymes, meters, whatever. You would find the people breaking all those rules are creating more beautiful works of art, of poetry, than the very rigid doggerel. But now, because no one is upholding those standards in language, in poetry, even the good in free verse poetry or rap or even slam poetry, even the good virtuous qualities that are in those creations that artists have made, the beauty is diminished because the contrast isn't there anymore, because we don't have the full range of, of poetry, metered rhyme, song. We don't have that as part of our culture anymore. You can still go learn it, but it's not part of our culture. But having said that, I would argue in closing, the West is always accented towards perfection, towards the exceptionally beautiful. Everything that exists is supported by perfect form, abstract form, permanence, it's, it's stable, it's unchanging. Um, 
the Eastern philosophies have a different proportionality to them of the elevation of certain qualities that are beautiful about objects or cities or human beings. Wabi-sabi is beauty in the East. It is. It is one of the foundational principles and qualities of beauty as seen in the Eastern worldview through the lens of Buddhism, especially and particularly Buddhism in the, in the Far East. The, the Mahayana is a dominant tradition in most Eastern Asian countries in Buddhism. It's a primary element of beauty in the East, whereas in our experience of it, it's, it's there and it matters. But I don't know if there's a word or a name for it that encapsulates it the same way wabi-sabi does. And it's disproportionately inferior in the West. We're mostly inclined to want to see the most beautiful thing in its perfection. We don't consider imperfection uh, beyond the character building that I described earlier, but that's not a primary concept in beauty in the West, as is discussed in philosophy or, or even in, you know, perhaps theology or the arts themselves that produce them. We're always acting against that backdrop, that Platonism that has been transmitted through Christianity to us today. The difference between the East and West and how they deal with this concept is in the West, it exists but doesn't necessarily have a name. It's more uh, an experience of the individual according to that person's taste. Whereas in the East, it's a primary concept in how they view the world. Through the lens of Buddhism, it's, it's, uh, the Buddhism doesn't talk about unchanging, eternal, perfect abstractions. It doesn't, it doesn't in any way allow for that. It can't because it's, its entire reason for what it's communicating in the sutras is to help people escape samsara, you know, the constant rebirths, and to understand the imperfection, the, 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 the quality of uh, temporary impermanence. Everything is impermanent. What's more, it's an illusion. It's not real. It's a totally imaginary world. And so to have permanence in that goes against the paradigm. I'm not saying that they, they don't have admiration for perfection or basic symmetry. It's, their standards are different from ours, and their architecture and their paintings, different styles, calligraphy. But it isn't designed to be symmetry, symmetrical because they're drawing from their culture a craving for permanence uh, of, of encapsulating what the truth is, the truth. For them, the truth, underlying everything they do, is impermanence. Impermanence. Wabi-sabi isn't equivalent to anything in the West, I would argue. We don't have a concept. We don't have it that elevates imperfection to the highest level of our experiential understanding of beauty. We don't have it. So that's, that's all I've got to say. Uh, there's no named equivalency of wabi-sabi to any concept in the West that I can come up with. I've read a lot of philosophers, but I haven't read them all, and I have never undertaken to study their philosophizing about beauty. So I'd be delighted if anybody knows a philosopher uh, if they've read, I know, on the sublime and the beautiful, on taste, whatever, Edmund Burke, I think it is, uh, if they find something in some of these thinkers, I'd be delighted. If it's a named concept, if it's, if it's laid out well in a Western mindset, I don't think it's there. Uh, based on my experience and my studies, uh, and I've read a good deal of philosophers, it isn't there. It isn't there. We don't have... Uh, we don't have a paradigm that elevates that concept to the fore, to the forefront. So I'm handing it off to Chris now. Thank you very, very much. I wish you all well.
All right, and there you have it. Hopefully that was enlightening. And uh, if you want to know more about Wabi Sabi, there's a zillion academic articles written about it to read up on, or you could Google it. But, you know, if that's where your interests lie. But I'm not going to go any further into it. There's not much more that I can contribute. So hopefully you get the general gist of the idea at this point. But anyway, before that interlude, we were talking about Murata Shuko. And before we move on, I'll read to you a letter written by Shuko to his main disciple, which outlines his philosophy of tea. In this way, chief among evils is heart's overbearance, attachment to self. Begrudging the masterly and scorning beginners are thoroughly wrong-headed. You must approach the masterful, beseech their least word, and never fail to guide beginners. Critical above all in this way is the dissolution of the boundary line between things native and Chinese. This is vital, truly vital. Attend to it with care. Further, these days, mere beginners take up pieces of bizen or shigaraki wares, talking of the chill and the withered, and they make a show of being advanced and deepened, though ignored by everyone. It defies utterance. Withered means owning splendid pieces, knowing their savor fully, and from the heart's ground advancing and deepening so that all after become chill and lean. It is this that has power to move. Further, though it is so, the person wholly incapable must not turn contentious over the tools of the way. And however artful one's motions, a painful self-awareness is crucial. Overbearance and attachment simply obstruct. And the way lies unattainable if there's no overbearance at all also. And Shuko ends this letter with a philosophical quote, which states, Grow up the heart's master, not the heart mastered. So in other words, keep all worldly desires under control. Master your desires, don't let them master you. So at this point, we'll move on to the next generation of tea masters. Take no Jo is another guy on the Mount Rushmore of tea. He was born in 1502, which coincidentally was the year that Murata Shuko died. And for some historical context for the listeners that know Japanese history, that was during Japan's Sengoku period, the Warring States period. Take no Jo was born about five years after Sengoku Daimyo Morimoto Nari and about 32 years before Oda Nobunaga. So that should kind of give you an idea where he fit in historically. And the Takeno family was supposedly descended from the Takeda of Wakasa province. And Takeno's father apparently changed the name from Takeda to Takeno. And don't mistake this Takeda clan for the Kai Takeda, otherwise known as Takeda Shingen's clan. The Wakasa Takeda were apparently a corollary branch of the Kai Takeda, but as far as I know, they weren't directly associated except in the old PC game Shogun Total War, so not really sure exactly what the relation was there. But the Wakasa Takeda were mostly known for their cultural pursuits and also for backing Akechi Mitsuhide when he rebelled against Nobunaga. And if you know Japanese history, that didn't work out at all. Mitsuhide was killed and so was the head of the Wakasa Takeda. And I'm not really sure what happened to them after that. But anyway, back to Take no Jo. So he grew up in the city of Sakai, and he was the son of a well-off merchant who supplied leather for armor making to the Miyoshi clan. And for whatever reason, Take no Jo didn't follow in his father's footsteps. He was apparently a poet first, having studied with the aristocrat Fujiwara Sanetaka, who also eventually introduced him to tea. Take no later gained patronage from the on-again, off-again allies of the Mori clan, the Ouchi. And you might remember that the Ouchi clan in Suo province, or modern-day Yamaguchi prefecture, had created a sort of cultural hub in western Japan. And Takeno was part of this. The Ouchi clan did their best to build a western version of Kyoto and were apparently quite successful at building a cultural center in Suo province. So, as a member of the western cultural elite, Takeno also received court rank due to his family ties. And later he learned tea from two of Murata Shuko's students, and this is what he's mainly remembered for. Takeno popularized tea with a focus on the artistic utensils, like the long skinny spoon thing used to scoop the tea and the bamboo brush sturdy thing, and I can't remember what they're called. But anyway, Takeno really popularized tea and Sakai became a hub of the tea ceremony. Takeno is credited with reformulating Murata Shuko's tea ceremony and helped it flourish. Takeno was also a renga poet, which was basically a form of party poetry where one person would start a poem and people would add to it as it went around the room. Takeno took this mindset with him into the interpretation of the tea ceremony, making the focus of the tea ceremony the interplay between the hosts and the guests. Takeno also had the attitude that you either dedicate yourself to tea completely or not at all. Here's a quote from his writings on tea. In tea, one can do either nothing at all or just that one thing. The human lifespan has a limit of 60 years, and of these only 20 are spent in one's prime. 
Those who immerse themselves deeply in the study of tea will not gain skill in the other ways. Even those who make a great effort in the other arts will probably remain unskilled. Nevertheless, one should take calligraphy and literature to heart. So basically, I guess aside from a commentary on the sorry state of the medieval Japanese healthcare system, I guess he's saying that if you're a tea master, you can only be good at that, but do other stuff too. I, I, that kind of leaves me wondering if maybe he just wasn't good at other things and this was his excuse. Hmm. And uh, before I move on, I also want to mention that another reason that Take no Joe is remembered is because of some of his tea disciples. You'll find notable samurai including Matsunaga Hisahide, Hosokawa Fujitaka, and prominent members of the Miyoshi clan. And lastly, before we move on, Take no Joe left 12 commandments that explained the expectations that he held for his students to correctly perform his type of tea ceremony. And in case I didn't mention it at some point, the term chanoyu refers to the way of tea. So these are his 12 commandments. One should practice goodwill towards others. One's manner should be correct and harmonious. One must not be critical of the gatherings of others. One must not be filled with pride. Do not covet utensils owned by others. It is entirely inappropriate to think of chanoyu only in terms of utensils. One soup and three other dishes are suitable to the meal. One should not exceed that amount even for special guests. Men of tea may find utensils that have been discarded and use them for tea. How much more is this so for ordinary people? Men of tea especially hate to be seen as such. The man of tea observes a spirit of wabi and leads a life of quiet retreat. He should know the precepts of Buddhism and experience the feeling of Japanese poetry. One should lead a secluded life and feel sabi. One should also strive for the middle way, for one who appears too splendid is wanting, and if too wabi, simple or slovenly. There should be no chanoyu that does not consider the heart of the guest. Such would not be sincere tea. One's own chanoyu should also be like this. Also, one should not impose upon one's guest or ask them for help. So I think you can see he's tying tea philosophy and Buddhism with a focus on a simple and austere life with a focus on the person receiving the tea. By the time he died in 1555, austerity was the last thing on the aristocrats' and nobles' minds of Kyoto and Sakai, where indulging in tea was super popular. The market for famous and collectible tea utensils exploded, and merchants, nobles, and aristocrats dropped tons of cash on these things to impress their neighbors. In fact, merchants collected expensive tea wares in order to get in good with the local daimyo. It was basically another means of upward mobility for lowly townspeople. The cash flow into tea culture and tea utensils at this time kind of reminds me of the old times in the 13th century with the massive opulent tea parties. Although in this case, interestingly enough, the nobility tried to act as though they were doing things the proper simple way. All the while using stupidly expensive tea utensils, of course. But one author of the time took them to task for that and said something along the lines that an actor playing a beggar in a no-play doesn't live in a mud hut in real life, so these nobles shouldn't pretend that they are living in austere poverty. He was basically telling them to stop faking it. They were putting on airs pretending to appreciate austerity while being filthy rich, for simple entertainment, and I guess that didn't go over too well. Also by Takino's death, tea had caught on with pretty much everyone who could afford it, from merchants on up to daimyo and the shogun. And all this brings us to probably the greatest tea master of all, Takino's star pupil, Sen no Rikyu. And like I said up front, I want to dedicate a full podcast episode to him in the future, so I'm only going to go over some basics, but Rikyu also grew up in Sakai, and for whatever reason, his fishmonger father pushed him into tea. Which, in his case, turns out to have been the right move, since we all know Rikyu's name 500 years later. Rikyu first started studying tea under a student of Noami, and then ended up a student of Takino Jo. Rikyu's training allowed him to meld the more austere and noble tea styles of Ashikaga Yoshimasa with the more common, everyday style of Sakai's tea groups. And he not only became a respected Zen master, but also the most respected tea master in the history of Japanese tea. Rikyu was so respected, in fact, that it was said that whatever he did was considered correct when it came to tea. He could use utensils that would normally be considered the wrong one, or change the layout of a tea room, whatever he wanted, and it would be considered art. I guess you could say it's like a Jackson Pollock painting. I mean, I can splash paint on a canvas in random patterns just as well as the next guy, but I can't sell it for a million bucks because I'm not Jackson Pollock. But Jackson Pollock can. He was considered such a master that he was free to do as he liked, and it just became artistic expression. The same painting by anyone else would be pretty much worthless. And this was the case with Rikyu. Whatever he did in regards to tea was considered art. If he dropped a teacup in the middle of the tea ceremony, I'm sure all sorts of meaning was read into it. 
even though the cup probably just slipped out of his hand. Kind of reminds me of Monty Python's The Life of Brian. Sen no Rikyu basically reworked the tea ceremony into what we would recognize today. I mean, all the tea people I've talked about up to this point did their part, but Rikyu pretty much finalized it. He was basically like the last cook to stir the soup, so he gets all the credit. His focus was on simplicity. He took the tea ceremony out of the grand pavilions, removed the entrance that would have been dedicated to the nobility, and preferred a small room reminiscent of a peasant house or hut. He also lowered the door so that everyone who entered had to duck down, symbolically reducing everyone to the same level. On top of that, much like Murata Shuko, he stuck with simple tea utensils crafted in Japan rather than the popular tea implements imported from China. His philosophy of tea was basically that the simple act of preparing tea was a step towards enlightenment, and he developed the style of tea in Sakai until the warlord Nobunaga came knocking. Rikyu became a tea master for Nobunaga in 1579, after Nobunaga had risen to prominence by killing mobs of people for the past 20 years or so. And for whatever reason, Nobunaga was a big fan of tea culture, and he wanted the most famous tea masters working for him. And Rikyu fit the bill. Nobunaga seems to use the tea ceremony as a way to enhance his own status, but also as one of many means of control, by bestowing expensive tea bowls on followers and legislating who could practice tea. Nobunaga died in 1582, assassinated by his general, Akechi Mitsuhide. And after all the dust settled from that incident, Oda Nobunaga's former sandal bearer, the monkey-faced peasant Toyotomi Hideyoshi, was in control, and Rikyu began to serve him as tea master, and eventually became a trusted advisor. And I talked about this in episode 142, but Rikyu had a hand in Hideyoshi's famous tea gathering, the Grand Kitano Tea Ceremony of 1587. The tea ceremony brought together over 800 tea masters, students, nobles, and warriors, and Hideyoshi cut the ceremony short for reasons that aren't too clear. Some sources say that there were problems in Kyushu that had to be attended to. Others indicate that Hideyoshi felt upstaged by Rikyu and cut the party short because of that. But through becoming so close to the rulers of Japan, Rikyu basically became the last word on all things tea for a good 12 years or so. Until, that is, he was forced to kill himself on orders of Hideyoshi for reasons that are still unclear. Suffice it to say, after Rikyu died, Hideyoshi kicked all of Rikyu's disciples out of Kyoto and tried to take tea ritual away from everyone and make it solely the domain of the samurai. He failed, obviously, and after Hideyoshi's death, Rikyu's way of tea was the one that had won out pretty much for all time. From this point on, tea became ingrained in Japanese culture, and as we know, you can still find it there today, right next to the boxes of pokey, cans of CC lemon, and the kinoko no yama chocolate mushrooms. Right there on the shelf. So that pretty much completes the history of tea, generally speaking up through about the 16th century. And uh, at some point in the future, I'll dedicate an episode to Sen no Rikyu and probably look more into the tea ceremony. But hopefully this and the last tea episode should give you a fairly comprehensive history of tea in Japan, at least through the Sengoku period. So that's really all I got right now. So thanks for listening as always. And thanks to the patrons on Patreon for your support. And if you're not on Patreon, why don't you check it out? patreon.com slash samurai archives every single dollar helps make the podcast better and every single contribution is appreciated and if you can't help out financially which i totally get how about a five-star review on itunes just a thought i love checking out itunes and finding a new review that totally makes my day well except the ones that complain about the f word when the episode is marked as explicit but whatever all right i'm out of here enjoy your tea and i'll catch you next time <laughs>